This one's going to be audio only. I'm not gonna bore you too much with the details as to why, but long story short, I have technical glitches. I have certain issues when I record from the phone, extracting the files, the files are long enough. And this thing that I need to do might be very long. And so I'm not comfortable doing it from the phone. And I'm still not comfortable doing it from the camcorder, given the issues with the camcorder. You may recall from two, two videos ago. So I think it's a safe bet to just do just do it in audio form, this response I need to do. And it may be more apropos because I'm gonna be responding to a lengthy comment, reading it out fully. And so audio is probably the best way to go for multiple reasons, but chief among them being, I'm just stressful when I have the either the phone or the camcorder and until I until I solve those very, very boring technical glitches, the details of which I don't need to go into now at all. Uh, but yeah, just it's gonna be something different here. But before I get to that, the preamble actually has another purpose. Um, there have been a couple of people who have come by and said that they would be actually much more eager to click and watch the videos if I just uploaded the specific chunks as solo videos. So you know how I list everything in the low bar. At this time, I talk about this. At that time, I talk about that. And so a couple of people have come by and said that, you know, you should just upload these as solo videos. And then I got to thinking, I gave my usual response as to why I don't want to do that. It's the sort of thing I said in the video that I titled uh, Thinking Out Loud. I talk about the aesthetic of just long uninter uninterrupted talk on the internet. Just guy turns on a camera and just rants for for a very long time, that having a kind of aesthetic to it, but that's not even half the story. The rest of the story dawned on me fairly recently. And I think what may have got me to really think further is the, the first of those handful of commenters. Um, when I'm bringing up stuff that I really do believe in, in a lot of cases, these last couple of videos, when I'm bringing up stuff that I view as being beneath contempt, but really just unavoidable for that long, um, bringing it up in a video just feels wrong if it's a standalone video that thing is brought up in. But it doesn't feel at all wrong if it's just one small chunk of an otherwise humongous video. And even if the humongously long video is just nothing but me bringing up one thing after another that I do sincerely hold in, in one of these beneath contempt sort of ways, um, or just, just not worth addressing, right? It's not, it's, not even, it's not even that it's the lowest common denominator. I've, I've stopped using lowest common denominator. I, I use subterranean denominator now. So there's these subterranean issues and just pests that, I, again, the algorithm won't stop reminding me of their existence and so I'm just tempted to rant about them in videos, but I, I don't do it as solo videos and I never would do any of it as solo, short, compact videos because the actual aesthetic that is lost for that is not like crazy guy ranting for hours on end. It, it's not that. It's that the look, the look it has when it's one thing after another within a single video, it's essentially me swatting one fly after another. Right? But if it's just a video reserved solely for one individual fly and me swatting it, and then another short video for another individual fly and me swatting it, that's just too respectful of the flies. It doesn't treat them as the pests that they are. Whereas if it's a single video, it's just me swatting one after another. And, and because they are small in, in the non-literal sense, they should be made to look small within the scope of an otherwise really long video. And so that's just the remainder of the story. I know I know, I kind of got into that a bit when I said there's an aesthetic to long videos on um, just interrupted talk in, in, in an otherwise long video. But um, I just wanted to drive this point home at the very beginning of the video. I'll timestamp where the meat and potatoes of the response to the comments starts so that uh, if, if anyone doesn't want to hear that part, they can go straight to it. I probably should have said that right at the outset. Um, but there's an exception. And that is Naturalist Ted, who left me a thoughtful, gracious comment response. Um, even though the, I, I really only brought him up around the hour mark into the last video. And so I was really shocked that he listened that far in. And then, like almost on cue, wrote this lengthy comment that I, I do disagree with. Uh, but because he conducted himself so, so graciously. And, and I don't think I would have if someone brought up something that I uploaded and they sussed out based on the title alone what they thought my point was gonna be. And then they rant about it in a video and only around the hour mark. Uh, I wouldn't have left them a gracious comment. I would have been probably a little a little rude in parts, but he, he wasn't. 
Uh, it's just that I, I just do think he's jumbling topics that have no business being jumbled together. And I'll get to that in the audio only section, but I just wanted to do this first. And so this will be a different video because I have, because this person is not beneath contempt, not by a long shot. I have respect for him, even though I, I one thing I do hold from the, the previous criticisms, that's not really the issue itself. But I, one, one thing I do dislike is short videos on very complex contentious issues that have been contentious in philosophy for a long time. So that's the one thing that I think that is, is, is a strike against him that I will hold to. Uh, but apart from that one thing, it's just these disagreements over the topic that, well, I'll just let the audio only section do the talking for me, if that makes sense. I still need to record that audio only section, but I wanted to do this first before I get into that. Um, and so it's not just that I think I should be doing this sort of thing. I think that it, it, I would invite every single philosopher, whether it's a trained philosopher or just an observer of philosophy, if you think you're just too high-minded for certain small-minded topics, but they still bug you because you just can't rid yourself of them because the algorithm won't let you rid yourself of them, I invite you to take, take on my, my approach, right? Make it small, rightly small, as small as it is, but just treating it as one fly after another that you're swatting away by bringing up the issue and debunking it or rebuking it within an otherwise really long video. I think that's the full story, my whole aesthetic story. That's the full story of the aesthetic. That's putting a bow on it. On with the audio. Okay, finally, I'm gonna do the audio only section. I'm delayed, I recorded that intro, I think almost a week ago now. Uh, I procrastinated in the first couple of days after that, and then I got sick, so you're going to hear my sniffles and, and cough probably, because I'm still, I'm still quite sick, but I don't want to delay this much longer. Uh, and just to say that this, this may have, in, in some way, it may have the appearance that I'm just pouncing on each sentence in an argumentative way. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not dissecting each and every sentence, at least, at least in this first paragraph. I am stopping and going bit by bit because I think that's that's a good way of me enhancing other people's views of my perspective. So it's not a dissection of what Naturalist Ted wrote, but it is in contrast to his approach that I think my approach can truly be viewed for, for what it is. So I don't want anyone to think that this is me just being self-indulgently dissective of what he's writing down here. So it's hard to stress enough the extent to which he should not feel like his back is up against the wall. If someone had read out my paragraphs and, and focused on each sentence and said something about each sentence, I know I'd feel my back's up against the wall, but I, I just can't emphasize enough that that's not what I'm doing here. I just think this is a good, I just think this is good fodder, not even as something that I'm rebuking, but it's good fodder to explain how just apples and oranges these things are apples and oranges, whatever we want to say about subjective continuity, generic subjective continuity. It doesn't have implications for a lot of things, ethically speaking. And if it does, then it is peculiar that in nothing in this comment references personhood. And, and what I talked about in the last video, personhood bound suffering and how that is an object of moral focus, not just suffering. I mean, suffering in and of itself, if it's just some sort of AI simulation, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be worried about it just because it's not accompanied by a person. Really, the point I'm driving toward here is, is, a, is a kind of pluralism about what is an intrinsic bearer of value and disvalue. We have to get pluralistic about that or we're just going to end up in one or another type of cul-de-sac where we have to say that AI simulations of conscious experience, which are just hellish, but not tethered to any individual person, uh, they're not intrinsically disvaluable, or we're going to run into a problem with a reverse repugnant conclusion type of thing. And well, that should be self-explanatory, but I'll, I'll get into that as I, I read out his comment here. But yeah, just, just to stress again, this is not some sort of interrogation of his views. The, his views can be accurate. Just descriptively speaking, they can be accurate, but the implications, the generic subjective continuity is supposed to have, and, and just the implications of what exactly is consciousness. Because one way to summarize all this stuff is the belief that consciousness is contextual as opposed to personal, right? So it is con contextual and thus impersonal as opposed to personal. And 
uh, tethered to, to the person, right? Um, and I'm saying whatever we want to believe about that has no implications for the aggregative aspects of ethics. So I'm just going to start reading his comment here. And again, if, I'm, if you hear me sniffling or coughing or stuff like that, I'll, I'll try to get that out. But I, I don't know if I feel like doing much editing, so I'll, I'll probably leave those in. Um, firstly, my refutation of anti-natalism is only of the Benatar-esque persuasion. And I think that the boundaries here are not are not clear because I have certain things to crit criticize about Bene the Benatar-esque persuasion. But then if we widen the scope, uh, for example, if we decouple indignity and harm, which philosophically it's impossible to do because harm is just the stand-in for anything that is bad for a person. Like if we can say that it is intrinsically bad for a person, it is thus a harm. Right? So in the philosophical sense of harm, you cannot decouple it from indignity. But in the colloquial sense, you, you very much can. And if, I think that rings true for people far more often than the philosophical invocation of harm. Uh, and if we do that, then this idea that there's going to be a clear-cut boundary between the Benatar-esque and the non-Benatar-esque persuasion for antinatalism, it, it, it immediately falls apart. And I'll get to that. Uh, so my refutation of antinatalism is only of the Benatar-esque persuasion. He says that it is unethical to cause any human life. So it is unethical to cause any human life because you are inserting any human life into a number of natural lotteries, social lotteries, institutional lotteries, that from the outside looking in, unpredictability is the name of the game. And just because you're doing well, just because you think you have prospects that are, are good and that are afloat, the prospects for your child seem to you like they are afloat, it is only because you're not paying attention to the number of lotteries you are invoking that person into. And it is always unethical for any perspective life. Now, what people mean by unethical, we can get into, and it, it really is important to get into. I don't mean morally impermissible. I don't mean even morally odious, where we have to take a strong, negative, affective, reactive attitude to the individual person who has done this unethical thing. For me, unethical in a procreative context, if I'm going to say it's always unethical, I'm looking for a term like it is always morally dubious, I don't mean it is impermissible. I don't mean it should be prosecuted legally or even in terms of social backlash, like over the top mob with, you know, just the kind of like even in some anti-natalist world where the majority, the super majority is always anti-natalist and you have these few procreators, right? The sort of unethical conduct that is, is not the sort that justifies a mob gathering around the the prospective parents' home and essentially bullying them into getting an abortion or anything like that. It's not morally impermissible. It is just morally dubious. There's a great number of things that are morally dubious that we still maintain an, an, aura, an, an aura of politeness around the people who are guilty of that sort of thing. So that's the category I want to put my negative verdict of procreation applicable to all prospective parents, even illiterate ones, right? It is always morally dubious it can stretch beyond that in the worst case i guess if you have parents who know that they're suffering from some sort of congenital disease we can talk about aids we can talk about a lot of things here and they just insist on um having their child uh resemble that back to them once it is born uh because they want to they have some notions in their head things like autism so not autism, but autism with a D, essentially deaf people who believe that they're entitled to give birth to and raise deaf children because they're on some sort of a deaf pride power trip, identity trip, whatever that is, right? So in an ordinary case, I would use a term like morally dubious. In an extreme case, I would use stronger terms like, you know, AIDS patients or, or deaf people who want to raise deaf children and who go out of their way to make sure that their children are deprived of these things. It doesn't have to be hereditary in a straightforward sense. But that just to give you a, a bit of a glimpse as to how I, I err toward the dubious term, but I can go far beyond that depending on, depending on the context. 
So yes, but to bottom line it, it is unethical to think that you are justified in causing any human life because of the number of natural lotteries, social lotteries, institutional lotteries that you're going to be injecting that person into. Um, so let's move on. So that's what everything I say in my anti-natalism videos hinges on. If he only said, quote, we should not have kids in bad situations, etc., then I'd agree with him. So bad situations, this is where my invocation of indignity is going to come back in. Um, and de just decoupling it from harm for these expository purposes. Philosophically, you can't decouple it from harm, uh, and indignity just is a harm in the way philosophers use it. But if we use harm colloquially, it really does have to reduce to an ouch. So, yes, it is certainly true that in certain situations, you can be certain enough where concerns over ouchies or many other kinds of things, uh, I would be willing to give something of a pass to prospective parents who think that the odds are sufficiently low where I absolutely cannot give any prospective couple a pass is on these questions of the child you bring into existence will suffer unavoidable, irreversible indignities that are just baked into the human condition. They're baked into all kinds of organismic conditions. We can talk about humans, but we can talk about um, other kinds of um, organisms. We can talk about post-humans where this may be uh, averted in some way. But right now, that's still very much sci-fi. And what needs to be kept in mind is the extent to which the game is rigged from a psychological assessment standpoint. And it's one of these things where I don't see anyone hitting the sweet spot. People who emphasize the differences between the ancestral environment and the modern environment that we, that we live in, I do see people making too much hay of evolutionary forces, Darwinian forces, and they want those things, those things of course being very much ignoble, they want those things to entirely swamp this conversation or nearly entirely, right? And I don't, I think the fact that we don't exist in that kind of context anymore, I think that, that matters. But the problem is that I, I, I don't think the ancestral environment, having hardwired us the way it did, I don't think that's as irrelevant as a person who wants to entirely dismiss it is. So I've found myself existing in this weird intermediary space that I don't think I've seen anyone else exist in, where I want to put a lot of emphasis on the fact that the, the game is rigged from, an, from a psychological assessment standpoint because of what hardwired us and because of the way we existed for much of our evolutionary lineage. Um, but I also don't want to say that that's, that's the whole story. And when you truly reflect on why our biases, cognitive biases and, and other various distortions and blind spots, why they are what they are, when you truly reflect on the fact that we cannot get past what we evolved from, um, that you, you, you will see just how much you're jumping the gun by focusing on pains only, because you, you didn't flat out say here that it's is purely about suffering, but I think you heavily implied it. And you could say that's because Benatar heavily implies it, but in almost every single interview, so it's not that just you have to read his books to see where he stands on this, but in almost every single debate and interview, Benatar stresses that it doesn't matter what criterion of the good or the bad for lives, it doesn't matter what criterion you go with. He says that his asymmetry works in every single, according to every single theory. You can go with hedonic theories, you can go with non-hedonic theories, like desire satisfaction theories, and even these quirky objective list theories. He says his asymmetry and his caution, procreative caution, still packs every bit as much punch. So we can get around suffering. This is here, you're talking about how all lives are not bad because all lives, certain prospective parents, have reason enough to think that they can give their child a good enough life that is devoid of enough suffering. And that is really a red herring. That is really a red herring the moment you recognize that Benatar does not simply concern himself with suffering. Unfortunately, I don't see him talking about indignities the way I'm going to be doing here. But... He may talk about 
uh, frustrated desires. He may talk about aversions, but not specifically indignities. And really, the reason I would say mo procreation is always morally dubious is, is because indignities are an unavoidable part, not just of life, but of, but of daily life. And the way we get tricked around that is, is just, just what we are hardwired to cope around. Because if certain things, if there's just certain things about the human condition that cannot be augmented right now, we're going to tell ourselves stories that th those things aren't really wrong. So we can talk about ourselves as, you know, creatures that produce excrement and urine, and we can go even as far as, as, far as flatulence. Uh, these are these are really crass things, but but see, ju just the fact that a lot of people, when you bring these things up, the fact that a lot of people think that the person who brings them up immediately disqualifies themselves, that itself shows me the distortions and 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 the blind spots, owing to the fact that for so long we have coped our way out of the fact that every time we do these things, every time we do the bathroom business, we suffer serious indignities, and these are things we do. On a daily basis, if you talk about urination, it's things we do multiple times on a daily basis, the average person. We talk about defecation. On average, it's once a day. So this is not things that are few and far between, and I do think we can talk about them just in a sober manner. I'm not even... Th there's no punchline at the end of this, right? The moment people invoke these things in serious conversations, it is because they want to turn them non-serious. Here, if, if humor is going to exist... It is going to exist as, as an appendage, but the point I'm going to make, I'm being dead serious here, okay? I'm willing to go as far as flatulence, but really the, 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 big, the big out of the three is the fact that we're just, we are defecators and we are excrement producers. And every single prospective parent knows that the child they're going to bring into the world is going to be one such defecator. And so if you just think that it's, it's wrong to think that Every time we do these things, we suffer indignities. I just invite you to imagine someone setting up this clandestine surveillance system in someone's bathroom, and that person who thought they had privacy and who coped their way out of thinking that what they do every time they take a dump is, is bad for them in any way, is bad for their dignity in any single way, uh, because that's just just as as organisms who evolved and evolved to have a lot of these blind spots especially when there are bad things in our lives that we cannot change it is the only thing that kept us going is the ability to elbow out those negative things but again if we actually see ourselves from a third person standpoint the way we might when there's a surveillance system set up in, in our bathroom, but let's just not talk about us because that may be a little too on the nose, but let's just suppose there's a guy named Joe and he never really gave this much thought, but it was on, it was on the back burner, but he never let it come to the surface. It just kind of festered until one day, let's say he had this lifelong confidant who set up an elaborate surveillance system in his home and actually didn't just play uh, the actual footage of him taking a dump and, and wiping his own ass to himself, let's suppose he played it on some platform that was going to be viewed where a lot of people were going to be watching it. Let's say the Super Bowl halftime show. I'm, I'm kind of hesitating using the Super Bowl halftime show as my go-to example for things that are viewed by a lot of people uh, because I've, I've gone to that well a lot of times in the past. But I'm just doing this on the fly and I can't think of anything else. So I'll just use the Super Bowl halftime show. So Joe took this dump, his BFF or, or whoever it might be, set up this clandestine surveillance system in his bathroom and, and just day after day uh, exported footage of him wiping his own ass and taking a dump and, and kind of maybe even just looking at the, the turd on the toilet paper to really just see whether he needs to keep wiping. But I, I don't think any of us realize just how undignified these processes are because we would never in our right minds be insane enough to subject ourselves to a third person perspective of what we look like when we're doing these things, right? Um, it would have an entirely different, like Joe, if he saw himself at the Super Bowl halftime show taking a dump where the rest of the world sees it as well, Joe will never take a dump in the exact same way again because these, these copes 
about it's not really that bad, they only work because you're not embarrassed. And the only reason you're not embarrassed is because no one else is watching you. This is why privacy is so important in human life. Privacy is as important in human life as it is for all human lives, precisely because there's certain things that we trick ourselves into believing are not embarrassing or awkward or humiliating because no one else is watching. But that doesn't make sense. Whether or not there's been a blow struck against your dignity cannot hinge on whether or not the thing you are involved in is seen by other social agents. This is just the ancestral environment we grew up in tricking us, hardwiring us, hardwiring our, in our brains in such a way as to think that embarrassment hinges on the perception of others. It absolutely does not. One example that I'm going to use as kind of anecdotal example is some years ago, I let one rip in the elevator because it was 4 a.m. and I was sure, I was sure no one was going to be in the lobby at the time I got off. So I got in the elevator, I was heading down, I let one rip as soon as the door closed because it was the smack in the middle of the morning and I didn't feel an ounce of embarrassment. Sure enough, the door opens in the lobby and there's a group. At 4 a.m. there's a group of people and kind of fancy schmancy looking people. I think there were some sort of VIPs heading back from a, a night out or something. And, and, and they walked right into the elevator and I was cringing at myself the whole way through in the next several minutes. I truly let one rip. I smelled it. I thought nobody would be on the other side. I'm going to cough. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be doing these when I'm sick, but I waited several days and I, I just can't get over my sickness. And it got me to thinking, it's like whether or not I did something that should cause me to feel that I need to cringe at myself, I need to feel any degree of humiliation or awkwardness or, or embarrassment, that fact cannot hinge on the fact that other social agents sniffed what I ripped out seconds prior. Right? If I had reason to feel embarrassed and undignified, it had it, it just that reason exists whether or not there are people in the lobby on the opposite side of the elevator's door. And so yes, from that standpoint, when you truly let yourself think to this extent, you will see that all lives, from the standpoint of indignity, all lives see a sufficiently high amount of indignity irrespective of whether or not they see a sufficiently high degree of suffering and I guess the, the, the colloquial sense of harm. And so from that standpoint, it is absolutely true that procreation is always morally dubious. The closest we can get to, to saying it's not even dubious, is when we're talking about these cases of coerced procreation or just, you know, just families uh, coercing on, a, on a, I guess, emotional blackmail level, they're, you know, 14 and, and 15 year olds to uh, go ahead and, and get hitched and, and have have a kid not too long after. Um, like es essentially illiterate people who can't fend for themselves at all and who have no alternative means of um, uh, li living their lives in, in, in the event that they don't want to do this. So a lot of primitive tribes, I guess we can we can say in, in their cases, these, these were just essentially children who brought children into the world. So yes, there I can stipulate that it's not, it's not even morally dubious in that those, those people just, they, they don't know what fucking planet they're living on and they are emotionally uh, coerced into having kids essentially. So I'm, I'm not gonna include them. But the average Western couple, it is at, at the least, it is always morally dubious. And if people allowed themselves to think systematically about what is a dignity and an indignity and, and truly what is ignobility, uh, it does. It does apply to all lives. But but you and I agree that from the standpoint of suffering, it's it can't be quite as wide reaching. But that's the thing. I, I don't think it's fair that you implicate Benatar on this because it's not really that clear whether suffering alone is the reason Benatar is is being as sweeping as he is in his books and, and, and interviews. He might, though he doesn't use the word dignity. And, and he doesn't discuss it the way I'm discuss, discussing it now, I think some of his pull has to do with these things as well, not just uh, suffering per se. So, so the Benatar persuasion, I think at some point does dovetail in, into my persuasion. Um, 
it's just I think he he he's very influenced by these traditional theories of well-being. So he'll talk about desire, frustration, and he'll talk about objective list goods and convert them essentially into a objective list bads. Uh, but yeah, I can I can say a lot more about the ways our lives are more in. Uh, undignified than they are dignified and I do mean all lives and I do stretch it out to all lives because I am I have been thinking more and more about the last decade of people's lives maybe for some people that really the the, the truly decrepit parts kick in in the last maybe couple of years but but those things are you know the, the the old folks home objection really does far more work to make the sweeping case as opposed to the the particular case as to why people shouldn't be brought into existence if you if you treasure dignity i don't just i don't just value dignity i treasure dignity and one day i know that i'm going to say to myself well i have yes i have been going down this slope i am physically decrepit i am psychologically not as sharp i'm not mentally as sharp as i was and i know that at some point in my life i will utter the statement to myself Atrophy is about to peak. That is what most of us, if not all of us listening to this thing, one day we will find ourselves in a spot saying, atrophy is about to peak. And a lot of negative things in the way of dignity would have had to have happened to us before the term peak is around the corner. And so that's why I I really do think that um, we are all negatively implicated by being brought into existence. The only way to not do so is to tell some sort of masochistic story about overcoming suffering, a la Amor Fati, or many of these other uh, really masochistic tropes, Nietzschean tropes, uh, and I'm going to talk about those in a separate video, uh, or to tell that kind of story about dignity, and that a loss of dignity is, is not that bad because you can try to overcome your loss of dignity. And if you fail, it doesn't matter because it's about the journey, not, not the destination. Uh, but just, just, speaking, just speaking personally, I'm at a point now where uh, give me hellacious suffering because before you give me the sort of deprivation of dignity that I see in the average senior citizen when they hit their late 70s, early 80s. Maybe I'll get into that in a separate video as well because I have seen firsthand the stuff that goes on in a lot of old folks' homes that I I hadn't the last time I talked about procreative ethics in a solo video reserved for procreative ethics. So these people who talk about the average life and and life assessment and fulfillment and all these kinds of metrics where we allow the people to rate themselves, um, so much gets left out because so much is unemphasized or underemphasized in terms of the average subject being someone who will make it to their late 70s or heaven forbid their early 80s or heaven forbid even even further beyond that because if the excrement objection you're going to look at your own dump very differently when you see it played out by someone who betrayed you who recorded you taking that dump and played it for the world in a super bowl halftime show if just an ordinary dump by a middle-aged person is going to look that much worse to them when they see themselves from a third person's standpoint, it's going to look that much worse when it's not just a middle-aged person or a kid, but is is an old old person who, whose dumps are, are even just that much more or less less gracious. Uh, but anyway, I'm I'm talking a lot, and I should just resume reading your stuff because this is, I know the crux for you is not about this. The crux for you really is about this generic subjective continuity stuff but none of that should matter none of that should matter for the, for the stuff i'm talking about here and i think you understand that naturalist ted because you didn't talk about personhood bounded suffering in your comment where that was just such a huge part of my video and why i found your titles distasteful because antinatalism concerns itself with persons and rightfully so I need to blow my nose, so I'm going to stop this and then resume it in a, in a bit. I got to blow my nose because I don't want to do it during the audio audio itself. I mean, talk about poetic injustice. I'm doing something as undignified as blowing my nose and coughing and just specifically between a video I'm doing where I'm, t- I'm talking about indignities in, in, a, in a way that I don't think I have on my channel. 
pr- prior to now. So it's just weird. I'm experiencing a, a sort of excess indignity just because I'm sick and, and yet I'm thinking about it. I wonder if there was a connection. I don't think there was because I was thinking about this for months prior anyway, but um, it's just interesting that I'm, <laughs> I'm in Snotville here. And in the meantime, I'm talking about flatulence and excrement and all these things. It's just, it's a, it's a gooey kind of day, both in terms of my personal life and in terms of what I'm talking about. It's a kind of gooey day. Uh, on with the comment. Um, so that's what everything I say in my antinatalism video hinges on. If he only said we should not give, we should not have kids in bad situations, etc., then I'd agree with him. So yeah, so maybe after, you could just tell me in terms of a specific point of persuasion. Do you now have a wider view of what is a bad situation after having heard me say everything I said about indignities? So you quote him, we should not have kids in bad situations. But surely the scope of what is a bad situation sh- should be more pluralistic than what you may have thought going in before you clicked on this video. Uh, then I'd agree with him. We shouldn't give birth to babies we know will be deformed in ways that will cause that individual to suffer much more than the average person suffers. So sorry, but I just got to harp on this we stuff again. And I know I did it because I, I listened back to my recording. So I, I did the we thing too. So we just all need to get out of the habit of saying we for things that we just know we are not implicated in. I know that it's viewed as the diplomatic and gracious approach to public discourse, but it is also so damn inauthentic. And it's easier said than done to jettison it. But I, I'm just going to harp on it for at least a, a bit longer. right? So prospective parents shouldn't. It's, it's, it's not we. Um, the individual to suffer much more than the average person suffers or anyone else we know will be doomed to a hellish life or anything close to hellish, really. So if it's, yeah, I, I mean, if you also have anything, the anything close to hellish applied to suffering, I don't see why you would refuse to have it apply to these thresholds of dignity and, and indignity. Uh, so for me, we all do fall well below the sufficiency threshold a la dignity. Uh, so Benatar kind of paints all lives with the same brush because he says that even the best lives are bad. The best lives are bad in certain respects. They can be well beyond bad. They can be, they can be well beyond good even. They can be stellar. They can be idyllic in certain respects. I'm not even denying that. I'm just saying there's a, there's a multiplicity of ways that lives can go good and bad. And every single one of those branches, we ought to be more concerned with avoiding the bad than we are with assuring the good. To, to, to prevent one bad is more important than it is to manifest a, a number of goods. Um, so it doesn't just go for different uh, types of pursuits. See, when people hear me say that, they immediately convert it to specific types of pursuits an individual might wish to embark on. No, no, here I'm just talking about in terms of a criterion, not in terms of a, like a, a, what type of lifestyle you want to live. It's, it's much deeper than that. Uh, and should not have been caused to exist. So in this way, he equalizes all lives. I don't think so. I think he simply points out that there's a threshold that all lives fail to meet. But I have no problem pointing out that certain people are more dignified than others across an entire lifespan. But that still doesn't change the fact that they fall well short of a sufficiency threshold for dignity. Uh, and you point me to a person who's never had to defecate or urinate throughout their whole lives, and I will say, okay, that person is probably the best candidate for someone who might have reached one such um, uh, dignity threshold. Uh, it's just, you'd have to get into kind of futurism and, and the, the, the post-human thing to to really get that off the ground. And you know, if, if some people hear that now who are on Team Human, because every now and then I pop into InfoWars and I, I hear Alex Jones say, we're, we're, we're Team Human, we're against the post-humans, we're against the the futurists, we're against the, the kind of AI obsessive crowds. We're just, we just want Team Human. We want humans to remain in their current kind of organismal status quo and not be meddled with. We don't want bioenhancement. We don't want any of these things. They're, the, 99% of the time, if not always, what they spend their time railing against is people that they imagine to be maliciously inclined toward humans. Right, so I'm not maliciously inclined toward humans, e- even though I'd call myself a, a misanthrope. I have zero ill will 
simply because I'm going to point out that there are these ignobilities that are unavoidable, doesn't mean that, that therefore I want to see harm come to anyone who is afflicted by these sorts of things. But a lot of people, and, and even people as kind of intellectually inclined as Jordan Peterson, like if he heard me say everything I said about indignity so far, he would think that I have a kind of dark soul in me, deep, buried deep within me, and that I would want to see a bunch of harm come to those people, and that it is only through malice, it is only through malice that I can even come to think about these things in the way I think about them. And I just think these are just, it's just another kind of apples and oranges story. I don't have to have an ounce of ill will in me to have more than an ounce and to have kind of boatloads of low esteem for the majority of the human population. And I have to cough again. <coughs> but people as knowledgeable about the world as Jordan Peterson, they simply can't differentiate these things. And so the apple is the orange and the orange is the apple. And so I must be. If you were exposed to everything I said in this video, then, you know, I, I am someone to be fearful of and I'm someone to really keep an eye out on because given that I view all lives as falling short of dignity, that must also mean that I'd be willing to severely harm those people so that I could put them out of their existence. That's not true. I'm not interested in putting anyone out of their miserable existence, even if I view the existence as, as miserable or in some way non-miserable but undignified, a, a, a delusional existence, a, a delusional happy existence. Ultimately, that's on each individual person to figure out. And I just need to qualify it in these ways because I know that a lot of misanthropic commentary, especially with modern YouTube, like I really am toying with the censors, with the terms of service. So I just need to, given the babyish nature of the, of the platform I'm hoping to upload this on, Absolutely, I just need to point out over and over again. Misanthropy does not equal ill will. It does not equal malice. It does not equal me wishing to make a single person any more worse off than they have to be. I'm just calling it how I see it. I'm just calling a spade a spade. I also believe that I am implicated in these things. In case that hasn't been clear enough already with my... Uh, what you would call it, elevator flatulence example. I am implicated in this as well. I don't want to see harm done to me. So obviously that means that anyone else that I'm describing here, my description of the human condition and the way in which it's flawed and the way the ancestral environment helps us through these blind spots cope our way around that, right? That, that doesn't mean that we should go around and have contempt for people on those grounds. We should have contempt for people uh, who should know better and who refuse to know better, I will argue that, but, you know, ignorance is ignorance. And the, the masses are, are, are too ignorant for contempt to really seep in. It's, it's really, contempt should be reserved for, for different things that, that may implicate the masses, but, but not along these specific lines that I'm talking about here. Uh, so he, he continues, but generic subjective continuity comes in and says, well, if your goal is to eliminate experience altogether, since you see all of it as bad, then that's a futile effort. So talking about goals is just an entirely different, again, it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a political discussion. So the political discussion, I've been, I've been pretty clear about what I think the, the political angle for people who reserve a, a boo for kind of any kind of procreative verdict, if it's a, if it's a nay or a boo instead of a yay, uh, it, we should not even think about implicating any of those opinions along political or legal lines. So the moment anyone starts talking about goal, I just think you're going off the rails. Uh, we don't have to have anything in the way of a goal. Just as if you're a fan of chess, you don't have any kind of a goal. You just want to be the best possible chess player as you can be and... If you reach that goal, you don't have to take it any further. You don't have to convert the whole society to be enthusiastic along the lines of have, developing a passion for chess. And I think that's the same thing goes for these puzzles in population ethics and dilemmas in, in procreative ethics. The moment you're talking about a goal, you're, you're not talking, you're, you're not involved in a sort of conversation that I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested in, in being involved in. And I guess it's fair play. Benatar is somewhat goal-oriented. But uh, I don't think the merits and demerits of his technical views have to be implicated by that. 
if he wants to be goal oriented, that's that's his funeral. But if Benatar says, quote, okay, let's not worry about eliminating all experience as it's futile, let's instead just stop all of the really bad sorts of suffering, end quote. In which case, Benatar ceases to be an anti-natalist and instead becomes a spokesperson for a better world. Uh, no. No, by ceasing to become an anti-natalist, he would have to believe that procreation is not any of these moral categories that I, I glossed so far. He would have to cease to believe that it is not morally impermissible, or, or that, it, sorry, he would have to cease believing that it is morally impermissible, cease believing that it is morally odious, cease believing that it is morally permissible, but nonetheless morally dubious, the way I believe, and I don't think he would have to cease any of those things uh, and instead become a spokesperson for a better world. So again, it, it's, a, it's a walking and chewing gum at the same time sort of deal. He can, he can do it both while being an anti-natalist or without being an anti-natalist. And in his case, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what kind of verdict he would, he would land on. But this is absolutely something someone can do at the same time. I would advise not doing it because the world's not ready. And the world's far from being ready. The world cannot, the, the, the Volk cannot hold these two positions at the same time. That you don't mean them harm, but you are misanthropic. Or you don't mean them harm, but you do believe that they got no business birthing people. And that's just another, I mean, just the, the process of birthing, uh, uh, that's another one of these just indignity things that... Uh, yeah, if you actually just, just, just placenta and the umbilical cord, these are all just very creepy things that you can only see beauty in it. <laughs> you can only see beauty in it by the way, by way of the natural environment in, in the sense that you can't, no other story is allowed. No other story is allowed than the, oh, placenta is cool story. But I, I, I just don't think that that, that, that passes muster. It's clearly gross. The process of birthing, the, the whole, the whole freaking, especially from the second, uh, second trimester onwards, it's it's just a lot of igno ignoble and indignant stuff. Once you get a firm grasp on generic subjective continuity, you'll see why I take issue with his specific brand of antinatalism. But do you take issue with what I said about we can care about? suffering as this massive blob when it comes in the form of AI simulations, if that ever comes to pass, hopefully it never will. Yes, but then as good, honest to God pluralists, we can also see that at the aggregative level, we want to avoid things like the reverse repugnant conclusion. We want to avoid a great number of these nasty puzzles in population ethics that a lot of people want to say that aren't nasty because they want to be totalists, right? So that's, I guess that's one thing. Does, does your generic subjective continuity, does it flatter totalism as an aggregative formula in population ethics? Uh, that, the, you know, consciousness being more fluid than personal, ergo more fluid than rigid, then we are, it, it means that kind of to, to put a quote on it, does that mean we are all totalists now? See, I don't want to say we are all totalists now. And if you do want to say that, then I guess that's our dispute. Our dispute is not a descriptive accounting of the nature of consciousness. It need not be that. But let's just move on here. But to understand generic subjective continuity, you're going to have to read Clark's essay, Done. Maybe I haven't read it recently, but I've read it multiple times. You're going to have to read Clark's essay or listen to Sam Harris's podcast, The Paradox of Death, on it. Done. And again, not recently, but relatively recently. Someone actually posted the crux of that episode here on YouTube. Just type in subjective gen uh, generic subjective continuity and you'll find it. Tom Clark also did talk on it, uh, did a talk on it called Transforming Consciousness. I have several videos, probably too many, on it too. I've seen over half of your videos. I haven't seen the recent few ones because you really have been on a, um, like almost you're trying to be on a collision course with Benatar. Um, you're trying to get his attention. And I, 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 just, I just think that he, in his own way, is a red herring 
and you can be made to see why anti-natalism, even an anti-natalism that takes a mighty big swing and says all prospective lives are going to be bad and therefore it is wrong to bring them into existence, and especially so once you've been informed of the reasons for it, um, it can be as sweeping as Benatar presents it, and we can have the discussion of that without even talking about Benatar at all. Uh, and really, without talking about generic subjective continuity, really the only way generic subjective continuity might matter is if you want to say totalism is just what the aggregative doctor called for. And I don't think it is. I think aggregation is more, we, we need to be particularists about it. So I'll, I'll flash the, the entry on Stanford Encyclopedia. They have moral particularism versus moral generalism. It's this long debate that never crops up in any kind of uh, visible platform, but it's a fascinating debate, and I think it is far more fascinating when we try to figure out whether we are generalists or particularists along the lines of how we aggregate well-being, how we distribute certain burdens and, and benefits across different persons. And I, I lean toward particularism. I think that when you try to identify first principles and follow them no matter where they lead, and, and you, there's no amount of bullet biting you're willing to do, those things can be ghastly. You can have very few individuals incur a major penalty so as to bring a lot in the way of much milder benefits to a sufficiently higher number of, uh, a, a kind of a greater cluster of individuals, all of whom receive proportionally smaller benefits. So the costs can be ghastly on a very few number of people or just one in the name of distributing the benefits to just sufficiently higher population. And I've talked about these things before, and that's really the only place where I think these uh, disputes we, we might have about the implications of generic subjective continuity and this idea that consciousness is more contextual than it is personal. Um, consciousness may very well be that, but it doesn't mean that personhood should be treated the way eliminative materialists treat colors, as just these frequencies that are elusive. Personhood is not elusive, even though consciousness may be generically, um, you know, ge generically continuous. It doesn't have these personhood relevant start lines and end lines. That's fine. It may very well not. But personhood is still a robust concept. And just as, as in the kind of nominalist Platonist debate, there's, there's this long standing nominalist and Platonist debate. And if you want to be a nominalist about numbers, integers, fractions, or just these logical properties, right, to say that they, they, they don't exist, if you want to be that, and if you want to say the Platonists are wrong, because Platonists posit this otherworldly uh, realm, this, this non-spatio-temporal realm, where mathematical objects exist, where logical properties exist, right, you can see how a dispute that, that is a metaphysically substantive dispute, nominalist Platonist dispute, they can have massive differences there, but it really shouldn't be presented as having implications for procreative ethics. Even, even the most sweeping verdicts in procreative ethics, like the sorts Benatars going around proffering and, and trying to spread. And so I just think that the exact same thing holds for um, consciousness and, and whether it is bounded along the lines of personhood or it's not bounded along the lines of personhood. It just doesn't matter. Personhood is something that we should talk about as having major implications for how we treat each other as ethical people. We first and foremost see each other as persons. This doesn't mean we see each other as selves. See? So selfhood, yes, by all means, generic, subject con generic subjective continuity can attack selfhood. Because selfhood wants to say, uh, well, we are selves, and we are metaphysical unities, not just qua persons, but qua selves. And selves act upon the world. See, I, I don't believe that selves act upon the world. I don't believe anything can act upon the world. I'm happy to call ourselves agents, but I still understand that we are embedded in the world. So as persons, it makes sense. It is coherent to say persons exist as these metaphysical unities, but they are always and everywhere embedded in, in the world. Selves, 
No, selves act upon the world, and that's where you should have your ire directed towards. These people who really do believe that selves are, you know, the kind of self-ownership things. The only way you can believe in self-ownership is if you believe that you act upon the world as an agent. You know, I, I believe each and every one of us is embedded in the world, and that's compatible with personhood. And personhood has these important implications for how we aggregate, and even how we construe interests on the first order level. Uh, I'm gonna blow my nose and uh, uh, maybe say a bit more. And I'm back. Some people get it after reading the essay while others have to take in a lot more content. Yeah, don't do this, this get it stuff as a way of saying if anyone objects, it's, it's pretty much heavily implied that if anyone objects, not even to the thing itself, but to its implications, you believe these things have implications to it, uh, so if the objection comes in that way, well, we, we don't get it. <laughs> to, to get it is to essentially nod along with you. Maybe that's not the impression you want to give off, but that is how it's coming across with just some of the ways you talk about this casually. Uh, some people get it after reading the essay, while others have to take in a lot more content. I mean, I get it. It's not really that... I, I'm not going to say it should be uncontroversial, because just, just as a philosophical subject... It immediately should be controversial because every, anything that is non-empirical, I file in the. I'm, I'm open to it being a controversy, right? But let's say even if even if I believe it was so goddamn obvious that uh, these views on death and generic subjective continuity uh, could be talked about in these ways, where I just say you either agree with me and get it, or you don't agree agree with me and you don't get it. I still wouldn't extend that to the implications of those views, especially implications on things like like procreative ethics and how do we construe of interests, right? So the first thing you need to do is tell me whether you believe that interests are personhood bounded or whether they're just straightforwardly fluid, whether consciousness is like can, can be spoken about as this super organism uh, because of your views on consciousness. I, I don't think that's the implication. Um, and so I just, I thought I was clear in the first round the, the, when I spoke about your, uh, your stuff about an hour into my last video. I thought I was clear that that was the decisive question you had to answer. And you, you wrote a lot here and you didn't answer it. Sorry about the siren. I'm not recording this at the best possible time. It's very, it's very busy outside. Uh, just a warning, I'm a slow talker. No, you're okay. Uh, and I do not think I'm genius or anything like that. I, I don't think I'm a genius either. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to be confident about certain topics that I spent a lot of time thinking about. So I don't want to give off the vibe that I think I'm a genius. I, I guess you pointed out that you're not because maybe I give a vibe that I'm expecting too much. I'm, I'm not expecting too much of anyone. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting to be understood, I guess. So maybe that's that's too much. But I don't think I'm a genius I just know I have a humongous appetite for these topics, and so maybe I can, um, m maybe I put people into defensive and make them feel like they have to qualify that they don't think they're geniuses. Uh, so if that's my tone, sorry, but you you don't have to point that stuff like that out. Uh, I've been accused of wanting to sound smart and made fun of by a lot of people. I've just come to blocking anyone that's abusive. Yeah, I don't know. I tend to have fun with my hecklers, but. Maybe that's because I don't have nearly as many hecklers as I used to have. But uh, yeah, when there's one too many of them, then it can be annoying. And I can see the temptation to want to block because if you don't engage them, then it's essentially pie thrown at your face that you can't retaliate if there's just too many people throwing pies at your face. But I don't really have that much of a problem these days. It's just the occasional pie thrower and I, I just block the pie and I throw it back at them ferociously and I win. So... Yeah, but if you got a lot in the way of hecklers, that's impossible to do. Uh, I actually came to realize generic subjective continuity on my own about six months before learning about Tom Clark. Back then, I was calling it synonymous self. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that. And other things. I realized that a few weeks after my brother died, uh, I'm not sure why I'm so obsessed with it. Most other things just don't seem all that interesting to me since I've come to understand generic subjective continuity. Yeah, see, so I, I think it's so clear that you do think these things can be imported into other topics in a way that I just can't. Uh, but GSC has definitely caused me to see very good reason to endorse kindness. Y yeah, I, 
I have to say I'm I'm the opposite way. I I am ethical in a way most people are not because I am attuned to high stakes situations. Right? So if if, if there's something high stakes, then I'm going to think of myself primarily as a moral agent. So like if I'm in the presence of someone who is in dire straits, uh, which I, I guess in a way I'm always in the presence of someone like that because money can be transferred digitally. So this is now I'm taking this toward a effective altruism direction, which I it's the the next video I'm going to be. Oh, I'm going to be going off on William McCaskill because of the way he thinks he can talk about generations and <laughs> the future will look at us badly. And oh, I have so many things to say about that. But yeah, um, if I construe myself primarily as a moral agent. It is when someone is extremely badly off and I'm in a position to help them. But short of that, if I'm in the presence of just people who are about as well off as I am in these comfy Western uh, settings, um, yeah, m most of us are comfy. And so if I have a chance to be kind to people who are already comfy, or if I ch have a chance to be a little, a little mean and a little short with them, I'm going to choose the latter and that's because I construe myself primarily as an epistemic agent when, when I'm dealing with people. I just love to ruffle their feathers and I love to make them feel, I love to make them squirm because I do see a lot of deception that they practice just casually because we're born and raised to value um, certain kinds of pursuits that only work by way of deception. Um, you listen to my last couple of videos, you can see me expound on that. So yeah, my kindness has certainly taken a backseat to those things. Um, just just the fact that I'm contractually obligated to be around people who I would not want to be around ha ha had I not needed to work, uh, that has really put me over the limit and has made me leave behind kindness, even, even politeness, a lot of these sorts of things where they're not high stakes. There's a couple of people who are depressed at my workplace, so I guess I'm a little more ginger around them. But the vast majority of people, I'm, I'm just not a kind person anymore because I have to be honest. That's the first thing that as an epistemic agent, not only intellectually honest in, internally, but also externally honest with, with the world. Cough time. <coughs> I've always tried to be a good person. And we all already have plenty of reasons to be kind to all life, but generic subjective continuity gives us yet another, which is based in naturalism. So I feel it's important to point out because many religious people say naturalism cannot give us reasons to be good. Yeah, so they do have to answer the age-old question, is something good because God wills it, or divinity wills it, or some sort of metaphysical extravagance wills it? Or... Does God will it because it's good? The moment they say, and don't let them ever wiggle around this. The moment they said, whatever is good is good because God wills it. Then they just have to open themselves up to endorsing any number of horrific things. Simply on account of the fact that this ultimate agent, God, has willed them. The only way they can get around that, and theodicy be damned, like theodicy, a branch of theology will try to tiptoe around that, will try to use a lot of sophistry to get you to think alternatively, but it's it's just impossible. Like the only way is to say that God wills it because it is good. The thing he wills, the goodness is baked into it itself. Otherwise, they're just going to have to sign up for there being no limits to the amount of depravity they're willing to sign off on, because th then they're saying their intuitions are not to be trusted. And so the moment they say, God wills it, it, it is good precisely because God, God wills it, they've spat on their own intuitions. Um, so yes, even, even if it's true that we need metaphysical extravagance in some sort of a, as, as a connection to recognize the good, that good simply has to be baked into itself. It cannot be made good by way of God's will or an angel's will or whatever the fancy metaphysical object is. And, and having its will do the work that, that makes it good. It, ha it has to be the external subjects or agents will has to be completely irrelevant when it comes to the thing itself and why it is good. Will cannot make it good. It is good on its own. Uh, I touch on this in a few of my videos. I think it gives us reason to do the exact opposite of hurting people as you implied. 
just because there's going to be an endless amount of conscious experience. So yeah, I really don't know what you're going to come back with on this. Consciousness is generic and fluid. This casts aspersions on personhood, at least I read you saying that. I may be reading a bit too much into it. Um, but nonetheless, we shouldn't be phased by the prospect of the intrinsic bearers of suffering being potentially infinite. Shouldn't matter anyway, because each person's suffering is indeed finite. Each person's suffering is indeed finite, and therefore it absolutely matters whether we can increase or decrease it. Right? So, so we're on the same page there, but then I really still, I'm having a hard time seeing where you think Benatar's position goes wrong because we recognize the truth of generic subjective continuity. I'm still not clear on that. When you start talking about goals, just remember, goals are about as irrelevant as some kind of practical goal might be for why you want to be the best possible chess player you can be. You might want to be the best possible chess player because you want to impress people. Or you might want to be the best possible chess player because you love chess in and of itself to that extent. And you want to hone your capacities as a chess player as much as humanly possible, irrespective of whether or not anyone's going to give you any kind of kudos on it. So even if you live in a world where no one else cares about chess and you're playing against AI nonstop, and actually people look at you as a kind of dork for being so into chess, you still spend most of your free time playing chess because you love chess in and of itself. It has nothing to do with any kind of social or other practical mundane goal, right? And so that you just have to understand, just that is my view about a lot of these puzzles in procreative ethics and a lot of these ver versions in, in, in uh, population ethics. Um, it, it really doesn't have anything to do. The goal can be about as impractical as anything else that I've been involved in in my life. I would still not change my attitude toward it, just as I wouldn't toward chess. Um, religious people say naturalism cannot give us reasons to be good, uh, gives us reason to do the exact opposite of hurting people. Uh, for me, that should inspire us to make the universe the best place we can, since everyone's death will be followed by one of the consciousness that is occurring after said death. So the, the fluidity angle. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I said what I said about fluidity. I don't need to keep saying it. I'd honestly suggest watching all of my videos on the topic. I will. I'm just a little crunched on time. <coughs> and honestly, I feel just attentionally from, from, from my attention span. I will just feel better watching your videos after I know that this has been uploaded. I'll be better in terms of my minute-to-minute -minute attentional pacing. I'll be able to pace myself better. They're usually pretty short because I use my phone and don't have much space. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to be having some of the same issues on, on my end. I make them as long as I can. I'm definitely not the best speaker. You're fine. Uh, but I feel the generic subjective continuity is very important, as, and so someone has to do it. It'd be great if you shared your thoughts on it after reading, viewing, and listening to all the content. So I may annoy you right now because I'm, I'm fessing to the fact that I'm, I'm going to be too uncomfortable taking the plunge on all those videos unless I've already uploaded this thing. I'm just going to be too antsy about it. So all this, the main takeaway from all this that I've said is do you believe in personhood, number one, and number two, do you believe personhood has serious implications for n not just these aggregative dilemmas, but in terms of making us recognize that perspective people can be spoken about coherently. Right? So whatever we want to say about consciousness, and we can agree 100%, that doesn't change the fact that, especially in population ethics, not only do they talk about prospective people as objects of moral concern, but they subdivide them. Actualists view prospective people in a specific kind of way that possibilists don't. And then we have, you know, I, I can't even do justice on the subtle distinctions, but I'll just the, the jargon is there are comparativists, there are variableists, there are necessitarians. There's just all these different names. Some of these terms, some of these isms borrow from different isms in the philosophy of time. I guess the main ones being the, the presentists and, and the et eternalists. So some of this jargon 
has been incorporated into population ethics because it existed previously, because people had these different philosophical views on the nature of time, and so some of that has been trafficked into population ethics. And all what they all do have in common is that they believe that possible prospective persons exist. And the widest range is these merely possible people that individuals like Toby Ord and William McCaskill uh, say that we ought to be concerned about them, just, just as merely possible people. I go narrower than that. I'm saying the only way a prospective person can matter is if there is something more than a merely possible person. But I'm going to reserve that for the next video because I've, I've, I've just had Will McCaskill on my shit list for the longest possible time. Just his idea of collective judgment. He's kind of bringing collective judgment back. And he has a kind of temporal categorization of it. When he talks about how will future generations remember us. So he's still doing we and us along the lines of ethical bl blame and praise. Um, and, and I'm just going to go off on him in, in my next video on that. Because it's, it's every bit as inane as thinking along the lines of we and us. The way some racial storyteller wants to spout it. The way some ethnic storyteller or any of these other traditional collective categories of moral kudos and moral castigation. I don't see why it should be. I don't see why we should be any more open to that when this kind of nice guy who uses the terms we quite like William McCaskill does to say future generations should look back on us in negative light the way we do now. But I'm like, I don't. I don't view previous generations in negative lights. Like even in... 19th century America before the Civil War. Like, if you were a slaver or if you approved of slavery, then okay, as an individual who existed in that era, I disapprove of you. But I'm not just going to say that as a collective, the <coughs> as a collective, the people who lived in the past should be viewed negatively simply because they weren't successful at stopping things like slavery before they did. No, no, no. I'm all, my, my moral ire only is directed toward the specific individuals who themselves were slavers or who aided and abetted slavers or who did not plainly disapprove of slavery. So it's all about individuals, just as it is when it comes to moral patience, which has implications for this potential dispute that I'm having with naturalist Ted, right? The bearers of value and disvalue are individuated to a, to a great extent because moral patients have to be individuated. And likewise, in my upcoming video, when I talk about William McCaskill, he loses sight of the fact that moral agents as recipients of moral blame and praise, and we can take it as far as guilt and innocence, well, the only way you can do that is by talking about individuals. And so you individuate moral agents. You can't talk about them in terms of these generational clusters and in terms of the future in this kind of collective way, viewing the, us in the present in a negative light. Simply because what? Some of us who had our heads on screwed right didn't do enough to persuade the rest to do more in the way of whatever he wants to talk about, nuclear disarmament, climate change, pandemic prevention, X-risk, that's the big one I'm going to go off on him about. Uh, no, 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 no. You always individuate at the end of the day. You individuate moral patients and you individuate moral agents. And so if, if we can agree on that, then I really don't think we're going to have much else in the way of um, like, like where, where Benatar slips up because he doesn't pay enough attention to what exactly are the implications of death and coming out of existence. I really don't think it is that implicated as long as you know that individuation is morally sound and de-individuation is morally unsound. So uh, from, from here on out, I'll just take it up with you in, in comments alone. But this first response to you, to your comment, I wanted to do it in, in a video alone. Because I'm feeling a bit under the weather and I just, I, just, I, just, I just don't feel like typing. Sorry if my uh, voice also sounded under the weather and if I, if I was a bit too uh, a, a sniffly on this. 
the next time I do a video, I'll make sure that it's after my cold is, is done.